I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an oceanographer, explorer in residence at the National Geographic. Some people regard the, the rainforests as the lungs of the planet. But in fact, most of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from the ocean, from little green and blue-green creatures in the sea, most of them very small, although seagrasses and seaweeds also contribute a fair share. 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from one kind of blue-green bacterium alone called Prochlorococcus. Have you thanked a Prochlorococcus today? One in every five breaths comes from these tiny creatures that are widespread in the ocean. Plastic debris, junk, whatever, is a new threat to the ocean. It didn't exist when I was a child. I come from the pre-plasticozoic. I have seen in my lifetime an avalanche of our junk in the sea, contaminating what is there. Hundreds of thousands of animals die every year through direct entanglement or, in the case of seabirds, where bits of colorful plastic are scooped up and fed to the young. Young who get so stuffed with plastic that they, they never fly. They just die while they're still in the nest. The reason that there is so much waste, so much trash generated by our civilization, it's partly because we simply don't understand, we don't know. We're careless because we think it doesn't matter. But now we know, now we understand that there are limits to how much junk we can put in our life support system and still have a planet that works for us. Considering the millions of tons of plastic and other discarded material that goes from the land into the sea every year. It's a wonder <laughs> that there's any place in the ocean that is free of it. In fact, in the last 25 years, I haven't been diving anywhere, even two and a half miles under the sea, without seeing some form of our trash, a lot of it plastic. But now that we know that there are limits to what we can put into the ocean, as well as what we can take out of the ocean, there's hope that we will actually change our ways. It's not just for the ocean's sake, it's for our sake as well. Over the 20th century and into the 21st, people have begun to awaken to the importance of forests, of grasslands, even of deserts, natural systems on the land, so much so that there are policies that protect terrestrial wildlife, birds, mammals. We have established about 12% of the land as parks, as sanctuaries, as reserves for the natural systems that we now understand are so important to protect watersheds, to protect the diversity of life that, that helps keep us alive. What has been neglected and is now costing us dearly is the ocean, the wildlife in the ocean. Fish, of course, are wildlife. Dolphins, whales, seabirds, these are all creatures that deserve our care. They do, after all, help keep us alive. It's time for us to return the favor through networks of protected areas. Large places, not just tiny little places, 12% of the land is far from enough to maintain the integrity of the systems that keep us alive. We need overarching policies that are dedicated to clean air, clean water, protecting the, the natural systems that make our lives possible, but it extends into the sea. The commercial exploitation of ocean wildlife has to be cut way back. It has to be eliminated in due course, otherwise we are going to eliminate the creatures in the sea that we now take for granted. Cod, swordfish, tuna, sharks, they're down to 10% of what they were when I was a child. <laughs> that seems a long time ago to some, but given the history of these creatures in the ocean, it's just the wink of a geologist's eye. It's no time at all. A little flash of time, we've had the power to change the nature of nature. We also have the power to understand 
and to take action while there's still time. As a child, my concept of the world was largely based on maps and atlases, an occasional globe that reassured me that, yes, it appears that Earth is round, has a sphere. But I have happened to come along at a time when geography has really blossomed as our understanding of the planet, of the solar system, of the universe beyond, has come into sharper and sharper focus. I love the concept of being able to switch on a laptop or a desktop or even a, a little cell phone and hold the world in your hands to turn it around through the new means of looking at the planet, of turning it so that you can see how one thing relates to another. A sense of place, that's what geography does for us, to show how we're connected, to show the oceans, to show how oceans both divide and unite countries, to show how the atmosphere above is an ocean of air, how it too is a common asset for all people everywhere, and what we do to any part of it affects everyone everywhere. Now we know that the earth is a whole place, land, sea, people, the wild creatures who share the space with us. Having a sense of, of place, of knowing where you are, at any one point in time, and see how your life is connected to all the rest of the lives on the planet is a gift of our time. It's become a really sophisticated kind of science, a, a new way of seeing ourselves in context. I love the concept of geography education. It defines who we are, where we are, what we are, and how we live in relationship to everything else. The biggest challenge facing us, facing humankind at this point in history, is how do we craft a future that, that is suitable for the likes of us? We have, over the last few thousand years, inexorably chipped away at the natural systems that keep us alive. But nothing more aggressive, nothing more damaging than what we've done in the latter part of the 20th century and now moving into the 21st. But it's like a race, because for the first time, we're beginning to see the consequences of our actions. For the first time, enough knowledge exists to be able to connect the dots. For the first time, we can look at ourselves from afar and see this is all there is. There is no other planet, no handy other Earth that we can escape to. We have to make our peace with nature, with this planet, so that we can have a future. And I don't mean another thousand years. The next 50 years are on the line. We will lose the big fish in the sea for any practical purpose of gathering them for commercial exploitation if we keep business as usual we will see a continued decline of many of the creatures we now take for granted if we continue business as usual. We will see a degrading of the very systems that keep us alive from the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's driving global warming and ocean acidification, sea level rise, to the m amount of trash that is clogging the planet's circulatory system, the ocean. The key, though, the reason that I'm an optimist and the reason that the kids today should feel empowered, glad that they're alive right now, because if you ever wanted to be around when you could make a difference, it's now. Because the first time in all of human history, we have the power of understanding, of knowing what the limits are, and we know what to do to make a difference. Never before have we known these things. We worked largely in ignorance in the past thinking that there was no limit to what we could get away with, to put in the sky, to put in the waters of the world, to take out of the land and the sea. But now we know. That's cause for hope. Never before have we become so empowered, and maybe never again will we have such a good chance.